Welcome to Beyond Inventory Optimization, a webcast series that focuses on hot topics around supply chain excellence and inventory optimization. This series of short webcasts is sponsored by Legility, and you can view them at any time online at www.legility.com. So let's get started. I'm Chris Russell, an executive with Legility. I personally have had the privilege of working with smart supply chain professionals in many industries around the world, and I'm pleased to be able to bring you these special interviews with some interesting and compelling experts. In today's episode, we're going to focus on inventory optimization's fundamental reason for being. What is it? Where did it come from? How does it magically enhance the performance of traditional supply chain management systems? And for this, we have an outstanding guest, and he's really good at putting inventory optimization into perspective, Dr. Sean Willems. He holds an operational research PhD from MIT's Sloan School. He has done groundbreaking research in creating the algorithms behind today's powerful inventory optimization tools. And he's also a down-to-earth guy who's a delight to talk to, as you will see as we get into this. I asked Sean to come on the phone recently and answer a couple of simple questions about, you know, what is this inventory optimization and why should we be looking at it? Dr. Sean. Hey, Chris. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Sweet. I'm doing fine. All right. I've been uh, reading the press lately. I need to, you to tell me. What exactly is inventory optimization, and what's what's the difference between the MRP2s, the ERPs, the APS? What where does this inventory optimization fit? Oh, absolutely. You know, inventory optimization at its heart is just setting inventory levels, locations across the supply chain, taking into account supply and demand variability. The challenge is that that people would think that these MRP and ERP and DRP and APS systems do that, but they don't. So multi echelon inventory optimization is really mathematically, scientifically deriving these inventory targets and optimizing them. What APS is doing is basically deterministic planning. So if you know your targets and you know your supply and you know the orders coming in, it produces a feasible schedule. So what I'm getting is it's, it's deterministic in the sense that it's like a big calculator, right? That's right. MRP was just requirements planning. If you had these finite demands and these inventory targets you had to hit, you know, how would you bring in supply to do it? Simple notion of scheduling. Then you had advanced planning and scheduling, which was basically taking into a capacity constraint and then doing this capacitated scheduling. But in right. none of those systems are they actually saying what the inventory targets are. They're just assuming the inventory targets. In inventory optimization, what we're doing is we're looking at the same supply chain, but now we're saying, okay, things aren't just deterministic and static. You've got variable demand coming in. You've got variable supply. You need to buffer those with inventory, and that's what multi-echelon inventory optimization is doing. It takes into account the different sources of variability you have, plus your lead time in the supply chain, plus the cost in the supply chain to say, where's the best places to hold inventory in the right amounts to meet, you know, your final requirements to customers. Yeah, this is good because you did a lot of the original research in this. You know, fundamentally when we started this work, I was at MIT, we were working uh, as part of the Leaders for Manufacturing program, and we were working with companies like Kodak and General Motors and Hewlett Packard, and these companies have made huge multi-million dollar investments in their advanced planning and scheduling, and they had these huge investments, and they were like, don't touch those, but we're not getting the benefits we want out of them. So we started to look at the system, and it became really clear. People had built all this math around APS and all this complexity, but yep. they were being driven to inventory targets, which were just rules of thumb, which hadn't changed at all. You could walk in, the company really knew they had this problem because they invested in APS, and they weren't getting the benefits they wanted. Like, they had this, like, Ferrari, which was, like, their APS, but it had, like, no steering wheel. <laughs> but they had, like, no, they didn't change the targets, but they could just go really fast. So it wasn't that uh, APS wasn't doing something. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely was doing something, and, and, and so what we really saw they had to do was set their inventory targets correctly, and no one had brought any analytics to that. It was just sort of like a, a text field that was, you know, weeks of supply, you know, by a rule of thumb, and no one had bothered to update it. Right. So we've worked with a lot of large CPG and computer companies, so, you know, billion, billion-dollar companies. Um, what's, what's the win for these guys at the end of the day? 
Yeah, well, there's uh, there's several of them. I mean, t- certainly the first one is just cold, hard dollars of reducing the amount of working capital you have tied up in inventory. And that's, that's always going to be the first order driver of getting people to care about this. So, so you're looking right. at typical 20 to 30 percent inventory reduction. You know, it's quite common if, if people haven't sort of already really put their inventory under a microscope. Even if they have put their inventory under a microscope, they haven't done it in this multi-echelon way. So you're still going to get a 10 to 15 percent inventory reduction. That's that's major. I, I think every uh, supply chain system since the beginning of time has been sold based on inventory reduction in part, and I think that's major to be able to come in after somebody's done an ERP implementation and say, "Oh, guess what? We're going to pull another 10 percent up." Oh, absolutely. It's a huge opportunity for for these companies to capitalize on. I, I think why it's so achievable is that you actually don't need to change any aspects of your supply chain. All we're doing is we're changing the targets that you're operating to. We're not changing the policy. We're not changing people's roles. So this is actually a very achievable number. So, so essentially yeah. you can bolt it on the top and suck them 15% of your inventory out, no much, no fuss. This is literally you have a certain operating behaviors in your supply chain. You have certain lead times. We can already characterize them because you're running your system to those today. Now, what are the inventory targets that support that policy and system you have? You can just update your target to move on. That's clearly the number one benefit. Then, you know, once you do that, then you get all sorts of sort of incremental benefits. Really, the next major benefit you get is that you're starting to dollarize or monetize all of these decisions. And right now, when you look at things like, you know, what service level should you provide your customer, it's oftentimes hard for people to sort of quantify that. You know, there's a lot of uh, finger pointing and emotion between, say, sales and marketing and operations. And these sorts yeah. of tools drain that emotion out of the process. Because yeah. then what you're really doing is you're saying, okay, to provide this level of service, given our current supply chain, that's going to cost us $100 million. You know, if we were willing to stratify our customers and maybe give Walmart a certain service level but everyone else a lower service level, we could drop our inventory investment to $80 million. Is that $20 million tied up in working capital really worth that? And you start to make these more fact-based decisions versus just you know, sort of some emotion around it. Yeah, so you've got the tools and the information. When you go into the S&OP meeting, it's not just the sales guys, the customer guys, having a knockdown, drag-out cage match with the operations guys. Exactly. Yeah, it definitely brings to a different light. Uh, the good benefit is there's really instant credibility behind those numbers because you're running the business to them. So this what-if analysis is built off the exact same models that you're running the business's inventory targets to. So it's not like people are suddenly going to second-guess the numbers. You're running the business to it already. Yeah, I would think it drives you to some some aha moments, too, where everybody just assumes that the reason you've got so much buffer inventory is that your, you know, your demand signal is dirty, you know, your forecast is bad. But then when you do that analysis, you're going to find other stuff like, oh, by the way, we have a fixed uh, firm period with our suppliers of six weeks, and that's worth 30% of the cover stock right there. You know, people in operations will say, hey, if only those guys in marketing and sales could fix the forecast, then our problems would be done. But, yeah, when you use these tools, you see really quickly that, you know what, they can only improve the forecast so much. And even if they improved it, you know, 50% better than what they're already doing, that's probably only driving, you know, rule of thumb, something like 30 40% of the inventory anyway. So there's a huge chunk, which might be fixed periods or maybe it's manufacturing's own schedule adherence that they're not as good as they say, which then requires the distribution centers to hold more inventory. When you really can break out inventory by cause, then you can really see, wow, you know, my inventory is due to this amount of variability that my own cause this forecasting variability, these review periods and lead times in the supply chain. Right, and then you can target these other initiatives like the lean initiatives and the, you know, cycle time reduction initiatives where they're going to have the highest working capital impact. Thank you very much for uh, elucidating me here, Sean. Sure, no problem, Chris. So, there you have it, my conversation with Dr. Sean Willems. I hope you gained some useful perspective on how inventory optimization fits into the world of supply chain management systems, what it is, how it works, and why you might want to check it out. Okay, that's it for this episode of Beyond Inventory Optimization, sponsored by Legility, a leader in collaborative supply chain management solutions with over 1,250 customers worldwide and climbing. 
Legility's Voyager Suite provides comprehensive supply chain management from demand and transportation planning to warehouse management, from SNOP planning to inventory optimization. We hope you'll take a look at Legility's website, download some of our white papers on various supply chain topics, and see how inventory optimization can free up working capital, reduce inventory, handle uncertain demand with confidence, and raise your customer service levels while actually cutting supply chain costs. Just go to www.legility.com. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Beyond Inventory Optimization.